everybody. Good morning, Red Oak Church. A couple quick announcements this morning. First of all, welcome, welcome anybody new who has not been here, coming here today. We're glad to have you. Thanks so much. If you have any questions or want some information on, uh, on, on, on coming to services, please see Kelly or, uh, out in the welcome booth in the narthex. Um, but again, we're glad to have, uh, I see some new faces, glad to have some new faces here. Um, annual meeting of the church is today after the service, uh, right around probably 11.45, 12 o'clock or so. Um, there are annual reports in the narthex as well. So we'll be voting on some new members, um, some committee members, and some other general business of the church. So if you're a member, you are encouraged to attend. Um, we are doing some painting in the Fellowship Hall the week of January 30th through the 5th. If you're interested in painting, uh, have some talents, want to lend a hand, you can sign up. Uh, there's a link on the website, or you can call the church office. Um, and we're also looking for some church office coverage for Bonnie while she's on a vacation over the course of 2024. If you'd like to help out with some administrative tasks um, here and there during the course of the year, please see Bonnie in, uh, or sign up on the website. Um, also, if you were at the Usher training session last week with Pastor Don and you have a volunteer application form, um, please submit those to Bonnie either online or hand them to her. Um, we're trying to come up with a schedule for the, uh, for the coming year. Um, so we need to get those applications in so we know who's volunteering, what services they're going to volunteer for. That way we can create a schedule. And then lastly, uh, Jim Brown has some t-shirts and sweatshirts available from, uh, that were kind of left over from the last order. If you're interested in any t-shirt or sweatshirt, Scott has one right here. Um, go, go see Jim. He's got a couple on hand. All right, with that, we'll get ready to worship. All right, everyone, we're going to stand and sing, uh, recite our call to worship today. Yeah. Go ahead, Eric. Good morning, Red Oak Church. Good morning. The call of worship this morning is taken from Psalm 137. Oh, Lord, you have searched me and know me. You know when I sit down and when I rise up. You kept me together in my mother's womb. I praise you, for I am fearfully and wonderfully made. You can clap. I heard you, some of you clapping.
is all my hope and peace Nothing but the blood of Jesus This is all my righteousness Nothing but the blood of Jesus Now hold pressure is the flow
whenever we sing that song, I always, I always feel like I have to take this moment and, and tell you how this song hits me different than it used to. Right? And, and because I think it's, it's related to today's sermon topic, too. So it's, uh, it's especially relevant. So, you know, there's this verse in here, right? Or this line in here. Even though you're gone and I'm cracked and dry, find me in the river. I'm waiting here for you. And that gives the impression that when we're broken and cracked and dry, God's not always with us. Like we're waiting for him to show up. But you know, once in a while you, you take a song and you realize that, and, and you see this in the Psalms, right? Because if you look in the Psalms, you see David saying over and over again, where are you, God? You know, when he feels really broken down. And, and then he realizes as he goes on in, in the Psalms, and as the Psalm builds, he'll often come to the realization that God is always there. And so some Psalms and some scriptures, I should say, have very deep theological points and others are very heartfelt, emotional responses. And, and I get that, that same understanding, right? You know, we're going to sing Good, Good Father next. And, you know, there's, there's a lot of you know, great theology about, you know, God, our Heavenly Father. Sometimes you have a song like Find Me in the River, which captures that um, almost footprints in the sand. Remember that poem, footprints in the sand moment? where you realize that whether we're cracked and dry and broken because of sin or whether it's from suffering or whatever it might be, we feel sometimes separated from God. And like the song says, you know, once, we, once we surrender that, we realize that he's always been there. It's that moment of surrender, right? Even in our suffering, even when we feel separated, even when we're wondering where he is, we, we step out in faith and, and we surrender that moment to God and realize right there on our knees that he's always been there the whole time, that he is indeed a good, good father.
Lord, we do celebrate and worship you, a good, good Father. Lord, I pray that you do what only you can do in this moment, and that is to fill this place with your spirit, to fill our hearts with your spirit, so we can worship with all that we are, to leave nothing back, to be all in in this moment that you've called us to, knowing that even as we worship you, you change us, you grow us, that the more we surrender to you, which is our greatest act of worship, is to surrender of ourselves. Lord, the more blessings you pour out. And no, it's not, it's not always by the way the world measures blessings. It's something that it's hard to even put in words. We talk about it with with words like contentment and peace and wholeness. But it's your spirit alive and moving in us and in this place. And so in one worshipful voice, we all say amen. Please be seated, everyone. We're going to get ready now to receive our, our morning offering. And so uh, at this time, we don't have Pastor Don here today uh, to do the offering piece. So I am just going to announce it from here. Same as every week, I got nothing new to say <coughs> other than your generosity is how we're able to, to have this time of worship, to be able to come together and, and do what we do. And so we're grateful. Give as the Lord leads you. Receive the offering now. Stand, everyone. Praise God from whom all blessings flow. Praise Him, all creatures here below. Praise Him above the heavenly host. Praise Father, Son, and Holy Ghost. Amen. Lord God, we are grateful and thankful to be able to be your church for the life that we live in your son, Jesus Christ. Lord, we ask a blessing on today's offering and on those who have given. But moreover, Lord, we ask also for discernment and wisdom that what has been given here what has been entrusted will help bring seeds of new life in your son, Jesus Christ, to those who desperately need him. 
Remind us in this moment of our vision. Remind us of our mission. Remind us of your love, of your goodness, and how badly our world needs it now. We ask in Christ's name. Amen. All right, everybody, the junior worship, they are ready for you. Vinny and Megan, are you ready for them? All right, we got the thumbs up. Okay, may the Lord bless you as you bless the next generation in Christ. So, everybody, we are in this series on Colossians, right? And I, I love the book of Colossians, and I'm glad to be able to do this series with you. And, you know, we've had this idea of, of this seed, it is Christ in the world, and, and we're going to develop that a little bit today. Um, you know, it, it's really cold out, right? And, and I got a little something to, to share with you, right? So normally seeds don't grow when it's like uh, nine degrees out, okay? But I want to encourage you about something. The seed of Christ always grows no matter what the weather's like. The seed of Christ always grows no matter what the weather's like. Amen? All right, so... Before we get into the sermon topic, and I'll ask Jim to come up and, and pray for it. But before we do, Jim, we're not ready yet. Okay? Before you come up, we have somebody that needs to stand up. Tristan Connors, stand up. He is back finishing his Paris Island boot camp on the Marines. Now... Tristan, come on up here for a minute. Oh, he's like, oh no, what do I got going on? I had a chance to talk with him yesterday, and he, uh, yeah, he, he got, uh, you, you got sick for a little bit, right? Yeah, and, and I, I believe that the prayers of, of these people have been praying for you, and I don't know if you know this, but, but people have been praying for you regularly while you were off uh, in your training, and so now you know. But he's getting ready now to, to go out and receive more training, yes? But not like boot camp training, right? No, no, we, we've made it through the hard part, right? So um, I would like us to continue by offering a prayer for Tristan in this next phase of, of his um, growth. So if you would just join with me, you could put your hand forward if you'd like to do that. If not, you, however you want to pray. Almighty God, we ask your blessing on Tristan now. And just as you sustained him through the hard parts of boot camp and got him through being sick and, and gave him the perseverance and encouragement to fight on and then continue on and to battle through. So, Lord, we ask for you to do the same during this next phase of his, of his training, Lord. And as he's gone over the next four months, Lord, we'll hold him in our heart, knowing that he's in your heart. Lord, remind him to always have you in his heart. I know you will sustain him. We look forward to great things that you'll do. Help him to be a witness wherever he is for your glory and your goodness. We ask in Christ's name, amen. All right, Jim Brown, come up here. We'll pray for this, this sermon now. Let's pray. Oh, Lord, Father, you are a good, good Father. You love us. You care for us. You protect us. You say in your word that if we seek you with all of our heart, we'll find you. And Lord, as we go through each day and each week, <coughs> right now as you sit there, turn your hands over and let all the problems and the stress of the week, let them go. Empty your hearts of all the stress and all the anguish. Father, fill our hearts with hope and praise and love and adoration for you, Lord. And as we lift up Pastor Ryan as he gives the sermon, I, again, I just ask you to put your hands forward and fill him, fill Pastor Ryan with your word, with your spirit. And as he gives the message, may his message flow into our hearts and bless us as we praise you, O oh Lord, for your word 
and we just thank you for this opportunity to worship together as a family. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. Sometimes it's like musical microphones. Shut the, the singing one off, go down to the speaking one, and turn on the preaching one, but I think I've got the system down now, yeah? All right. How are we doing today, everybody? It's a good day to praise God? Yes. All right. That's good. It's a good day to learn from the scripture? Yes. It's a good day to have the word come alive in us, is it not? Yes. All right. We're in this series in Colossians. We're going to be finishing chapter one today, okay? And you know, we've been talking about the seed of Christ. I, I'm going to tell you something. This particular set of verses, right? Verse 24, we're going to start with through, through the end of the first chapter of Colossians, is one of my all time favorite set of verses in all of Scripture, okay? All of them. Those who have taken the theology class know that. I, I quote something from this particular. Uh, set of verses quite often, okay? That and probably Galatians 2.20, which you'll hear me recite, I'm sure, again today. Uh, and, and it's not that, that one set of verses is higher or more valuable, okay? God gives us the scriptures and knows what we need. And at some moments, the idea that we, we said in the call to worship, you know, from the Psalms, that you're fearfully and wonderfully made might be what you need in that moment, Right? There's all different scriptures for all different occasions that speak to us. And each, each you know, set of verses might speak to people in different ways. Well, this one really speaks to me. Really speaks to me. And so I'm excited and, and, and passionate to, to share it with you. And, and, and I want to tell you why it speaks to me. Because it has what I consider the greatest plot twist in all of history. Now, that didn't perk your ears up, I don't know what will, right? Plot twists. Uh, what is a plot twist? Anyone? I'm, I'm sure a lot of you know what a plot twist is. But there's the idea in a plot twist that you thought the story, whether it's a movie or a book or a narrative, whatever it is, you thought the story was heading in this direction, and all of a sudden something is revealed, some type of thing that was a previously a mystery is revealed that changes your whole perspective. And instead of the story going in this direction, all of a sudden it took a major turn you didn't see coming. But the other piece of it is not only does it set up a whole new perspective, but it even informs and can change the way you saw what came before it. Okay? That's, that's kind of what's involved in a plot twist. So anybody know M. Night Shyamalan? He, he's he's a, a director and, and screenwriter. He writes a, a lot of different, um, you know, kind of suspenseful. He's, he's considered kind of the, one of the, the um, not founders, certainly, but masters of plot twist movies, right? He wrote uh, The Sixth Sense, which I'm not going to give you that plot twist ending because it's still in the last few decades, and I'm not going to ruin it for you, okay? But he's got that one under, you know, under his belt, split and unbreakable. He's done a few of them, and he worded it like this. I think it's actually interesting. He says, you know, in, in explaining his process of creating that, that plot twist ending, he says, what you're left with at the end of the movie should tell you what you saw. When you stick the landing, you should give them the keys to say, this is how I should interpret everything that I just watched. Right? And so when you think about like classic plot twists, like Citizen Kane, has anyone seen the movie Citizen Kane? I haven't seen it. It's ranked like in the number one movies of all time. I don't know why I haven't seen it. I love movies, but I haven't. After the first service, somebody said, I have a copy. You're getting it. You need to watch it. So hopefully, next time you see me, I'll have watched Citizen Kane, okay? But that's kind of a classic one. Um, I, the, certainly, The Sixth Sense was a, a classic one, right? One of my favorites was a movie called The Usual Suspects. Anybody ever seen that movie? You know, you know what a plot twist does. Then you're like, what? No way, right? But probably the classic one that everybody knows, all right, has to do with a movie where when this plot twist came out, it became legendary. And my son Luke was here in the first service, and I gave everybody a hint, and I said, Luke, it, ha it has your name in it. At least the way people quote it has your name in it. And it's from Star Wars, okay, from The Empire Strikes Back. Does anyone know what this plot twist might be? Let's say it together. Ready, Luke? I am your father. 
Now, what's so funny about that is it's actually misquoted, all right? It's, it's commonly done as Luke, I am your father, but actually it's a dialogue between Luke and Darth Vader, and, and he says, no, I am your father. But either way, same point. When that came out, everybody was like, what? And then you went back and you said, oh, that's why he wouldn't take the emperor's words to get rid of him. That's why he wanted to work with Luke. All of a sudden, it made sense of what you saw before. It gave you a new perspective that left you going, wow, I thought we were over here, now we're over here. But it reinterpreted everything we saw to that point. It's kind of like that today. However, I assure you, no Hollywood man-made movie is going to be able to top the granddaddy of all plot twisters that we have in scripture today. So with that, let's get into it. Verse 24, okay? Colossians 1, verse 24, all right? Now, I'm gonna go bit by bit through this with us. Paul writes, Apostle Paul, now I rejoice in my sufferings for your sake, and in my flesh I am filling up what is lacking in Christ, in Christ's afflictions, for the sake of his body that is the church. Stop right there. Don't go any further. Notice what Paul just said. That my sufferings enable me to fill up where I'm short, where my glass is not full with Christ. How many of us look at suffering like that? I would venture to say not very many, right? I rejoice in my sufferings. Why can Paul find joy in his sufferings? Because he believes that it's helping to fill up the cup, right? The cup was half empty, half full, however you want to talk about it. Three quarters doesn't matter. That his sufferings help to fill the missing piece, right, of what he is lacking in Christ. That's a really, that's almost like a mystery. Like, what do you mean by that? Why are you using the term filling up, right? That's an odd way of saying it. He doesn't say... You know, because and, and we do this as a, as a, uh, a Christian community a lot, right? I mean, I have suffering going on. I lean on Christ, all right? Or, you know, when we're going through hard times, we lean on God. That's common. But that's not what he says. He says he, he lean. By the way, you should lean on God when you're suffering, okay? I'm not telling you not to, right? That's an absolute truth. But what Paul says is, it's actually, I am filling up what is lacking in Christ's afflictions, it's not just that I'm leaning on him, but it's growing me in the image and likeness of Christ. Why? Why does he think that? You know, I'm going to take a little rabbit trail for a minute, okay? Loss, suffering, and loss do one of two things to people. One of two things to people. It will either crush you so you can't even pick your head up. Have you second guess everything that you thought you knew? Make you want to throw in the towel and quit? Or it will be fuel to the fire to grow you. But suffering and hard times and loss is going to do one of those two things. It's either going to crush you or be fuel to grow you, where you say, I'm not going to quit. I'm going to keep pursuing. I'm going to learn from this. I'm going to grow from this, right? God is going to somehow grow me in Christ from this. And for Paul, that's the lens that he experiences life. Everything in his life is either am I growing in Christ or is it crushing me? Right? I, you know, and it's true in, in so many aspects, right? Because most of life is team. So I want, to, I want you to think about this way for a minute, right? Most of life is team. Marriages are a team. Families are a team. Churches are a team. Jobs are a team. Relationships are a team. Most of life finds, a, finds its context in team, okay? And I can tell you from coaching, from coaching football, that when you experience a loss, you'll either see kids' heads go down, and it'll be like one gigantic snowball that just builds and builds and builds and drops you all the way at the bottom of the valley. Or they'll approach it like this. Here's where we need to get better. Here's where we can learn from this. Here's where we can grow because we're not done yet and this is just fuel for the fire. 
And if you look at people who have succeeded in their craft, who've done really well, whether it's in the business field or whether it's, it's been um, athletes or, or musicians or whoever, right? What has separated people from, from tanking out and those who have propelled to the next level is this attitude that everything that is thrown at me is going to be used to get me to my destination. And that is how Paul sees life in Christ. That everything is going to be used to grow me in Christ. So if suffering comes at me, I'm going to use it to grow in the likeness of Christ. Right? Look at Philippians. He says it this way in Philippians 3.7. Because remember, Paul was a Pharisee. He was a leader, right, in the Jewish community. And he gave it all up to follow Christ. And he writes, whatever gain I had, I counted as loss for the sake of Christ. Indeed, I count everything as loss compared, or because, sorry, of the surpassing worth, surpassing value of knowing Christ Jesus my Lord. For his sake I have suffered the loss of all things, and I count them as rubbish in order that I may gain Christ. That I may gain Christ. Everything I'm experiencing is working towards that goal. And be found in him, not having a righteousness of my own that comes from the law, but that which comes through faith in Christ, the righteousness from God that depends on faith. It needs faith in order to make it happen. That I may know him and the power of, the, of his resurrection and may share his sufferings, becoming, here it is, like him in his death. From Paul's perspective, even death itself is going to be viewed as another way of growing closer and walking deeper with Christ. Now, imagine we viewed life like that, right? Whether, whether Paul's on the mountaintop or the valley low, whether things are going well or whether he's suffering, his life, even his death, everything is viewed as being used by God to grow him in the likeness of Jesus Christ. Why? How can that be? Why? Why would he say it actually fills me up to be like Christ? Even my sufferings, they fill what was lacking. Not just lean on Christ, but actually fills me. Why does he think that? Why does he believe that every experience, what's the missing piece of this mystery? Look at verse, let's go back to our, our scripture lesson in Colossians where we left off. You could turn to, to verse 25, Tiffany, but I'm going to catch us where we left off in this verse 24, right? He says, I'm filling up what is lacking in Christ's affliction for the sake of his body, that is the church, of which I became a minister according to the stewardship from God that was given to me for you. Now watch, watch this. To make the word of God fully known. Whatever he's about to say, whatever this twist is that, we, that they didn't see coming, is going to make the word of God fully known. Again, it's like it was known, but not full. The glass wasn't full. Whatever twist is about to come down the pipe is going to change their whole perspective and bring the gospel, the word of God, to, to fullness in their life. Don't you want to know what this mystery is? Right? Isn't this going to teach us something about how to have a perspective like Paul's? This climactic conclusion, the fulfillment of the gospel to make the word of God fully known. Look at verse 26. He builds this almost like it's suspenseful, right? The mystery. Here it is. This twist is shrouded in mystery, hidden for the ages and generations, but now revealed to his saints. Now revealed to his saints. Here it comes, a moment of suspense. It's finally going to be revealed. Here's the plot twist of all plot twists, and it's in verse 27. Go for it, Tiffany. To them God chose to make known how great among the Gentiles are the riches of the glory of this mystery, which is Christ in you, the hope of glory. The suffering seed of Christ is now planted in you, which is why Paul believes that everything in his life, including suffering, is going to grow that seed in him. We've talked about this seed, right? 
We've seen how this seed has played out in Scripture over the last few weeks. And then we looked at Peter, the epistle from Peter, where he says, and you've been born again. You've been born anew from an incorruptible, imperishable, is what he says, seed. That that seed of Christ is now planted in you. Now, I know, everybody, you've heard this language before. Because I happen, like I said, this happens to be one of my favorite verses in Scripture. We talk about this one and Galatians 2.20, right? I have been crucified with Christ. It is no longer I who live, but Christ who lives in me. You've heard this twist from this pulpit, but it's not something that's preached about a lot in the modern era. And it should be, because it changes your whole perspective. And even more so, I want you to go back and imagine you were in the first century. Imagine you were one of Paul's churches. Think about it like this, okay? Right? Imagine the time. The mind, absolute bender that this would be. You had the Old Testament scriptures and the sacrificial system, and you had this idea of God, and then all of a sudden came the idea that God became enfleshed in a man, right, and dwelt among us. And people were like, no way. And then he was crucified, and he rose again after three days, and people were like, no way. And then, just when you thought you couldn't handle any more no way moments, all of a sudden Paul says, yeah, and by the way, that seed that was crucified, Jesus Christ, that seed is planted in you now. Whoa. Right. That seed is in you. It's like God's way of saying, hey, the seed of my son is in you. You are my sons and daughters now. I am your father. That's God's I am your father moment right there, right? That's, we got, that should change our whole perspective. And like every good plot twist, we're going to look back now and go, oh, I see what you were doing. You made us in in your image back in the beginning of Genesis, right? Then are you going to listen to the words of Jesus? And like every good twist, everything's going to be reinterpreted. Look at John 12, 24. Right? I tell you the truth, unless a kernel of wheat falls to the ground and dies, it remains only a single seed. But if it dies, it produces many seeds. Oh, I see what you were talking about, Jesus. But it takes that twist for us to understand God was making, is making, I should say, a new humanity from that seed of Christ. He's finishing what he started The old seed, that's why Paul in Galatians 2.20 that we quote so much, right? I've been crucified with Christ. The old seed, the old corrupted seed, the old perishable seed is nailed to the cross with Jesus so that the new seed can be alive in you. So that the new seed could, see, it's got to change the way you view everything. It should even change the way you see the cross, right? Right? A lot of us think, oh, the cross, yeah, the seed died, right? He was crucified. Yep, why? Oh, so that I can be forgiven and now I have my check mark to heaven. Okay, fine. But there's, this suggests to us, this implores to us that it's so much deeper than that, that that seed fell to the ground and died, that not just to forgive you, not just to wipe you clean, but to change the soil so that the seed can grow in you. Now that's the hope of glory, Paul says. The mystery revealed and finally at hand to the saints, right? That is Christ in you, the hope of glory. It's got to change the way you view the crucifixion. I was wiped clean. I was, I was set free. I was, I was made new. Why? Because the new seed of Christ is going to grow in the soil that God has changed. And that's glory. And now everything fits into the view. My highs, my lows, everything. It's like we talk about with that song. Pastor Don likes to talk about this. Am I a collection? Was it you say, I think, right? More than just a collection of my highs and lows. Everything is to grow the garden. That's deep. That's deep. And what's so interesting, and Paul does this a lot, right? So We've got this unbelievable theological twist, right? And then as soon as he's done giving them the theology, he goes right into what does it mean for your life? What does it mean practically? And that's in verse 28. Him we proclaim, warning everyone 
and teaching everyone with all wisdom that we may present everyone mature in Christ. That this seed is supposed to make a tree and that tree blooms in a garden and produces new fruit. We talked about it on Wednesday night, right? That new seed produces a good tree because it's from the good seed and a good tree can't produce bad fruit and a bad tree can't produce good fruit. He's growing something in you. It should change the way you look at life completely, right? Everyone mature in Christ. Last verse. For this I toil. Now watch. Watch how this plays out. Struggling with all his energy. Whose energy? His energy. That he, who, Paul? No, he, Christ, powerfully works within me. See, if the seed of Christ is in me, if Christ's alive in me, then it's him that's working through me, not myself. And that changes everything. That changes what you're capable of. That changes what you can do. That changes your potential. That changes everything. Oh, to have the seed of Christ in full bloom, that his power, his energy would be working through us. That like we talked about last week from Philippians, right? Work out your salvation in fear and trembling, for God works in you. He's working it in. We just got to take part in the growth. Be willing to be receptive to what he's doing. Because he can do anything in you. That's the plot twist. And so I want to give us... I want to give us three steps, practical steps, to taking this twist and making sure you live it out in life. Are you ready? Number one, let's go right as Paul did, right? You have to keep move, moving forward even in the face of suffering. You have to. You have to view it like Paul viewed it. This is not going to crush me. This is not going to stamp out the seed. This is going to grow the seed. Because just like we talked about earlier, hard times, right? It's like the parable of the sower in Luke 8. That seed, right? Here's, the seed's everywhere in Scripture, by the way, right? That seed is either going to fall on some hard-packed soil that's been roughed up over life and never take root, or it's going to fall on soil that's ready, and it's going to produce fruit no matter what's thrown at it. And you've got to persevere even in the face of suffering. Look how Paul outlined these verses. He started with, I rejoice in my sufferings because it's filling me up in Christ. He started with the suffering piece. Then he dropped the, the major twist. Why? Because Christ is alive in me. He suffered, so I know I will too. Right? But this is the hope of glory. And then he ends with, now go and live it out. So you've got to press on. You've got to remember that the ending is glory. The hope is glory, no matter what the current page of the script says. You've got to believe that if Christ is in you, that that reality, that hope has to be stronger than the pains of persecution, stronger than the sting of suffering. You've got to have a mindset like Paul that if Jesus can get through it, so can I, because he's in me. Jesus got through persecution. He got through rejection. He got through death. He got through all of it. If he's alive in you, then you can too, no matter what's thrown at you. People come and say, Pastor, I can't get through, I can't get over my depression. I can't get through it. Maybe you can't, but Christ in you sure can. I can't get over my anxiety. Maybe you can't, but Christ in you can. I can't get over this loss and this grief. Maybe you can't, but Christ in you can. It changes our whole perspective. It reinterprets, like every good twist, the way we see everything. It gives us the keys to unlock it all. When life is hammering you, you let your mind envision glory, and you remember there's nothing Jesus can't get through. And if he's in you, there's nothing you can either. Now, the second point's important, too. Because if we look at, at how Paul writes this, he says, he talks about his sufferings, you know, and he says, you know, basically... For the sake of you, the church, of his body, the church. Okay? And Paul's sufferings that he's talking about here, um, you know, are really the persecution of being a minister and, uh, and a church planter and growing churches and being an apostle, right? And so he's talking about that. But notice, he always brings it back to the work of the church. And this is point two. We don't do this together. If you go back to that verse you know, ah, I don't know how, how hard it is for you, Tiffany, to go back to John 12, 24, okay? But if you could, this is just coming to me now. Way to go, T. She couldn't do it, but Christ and her could. All right. All right, listen. 
I tell you the truth, unless a kernel of wheat falls to the ground and dies, it remains only a single seed, right? And I told you, in the ESV, ESV vert translation, it says, it remains alone. Think about this. Jesus Christ didn't want to be a lone seed. He wanted it to pass to all of you. We don't walk through this garden as a single seed. And everything that you're going through is going to have the power to influence one way or another all the other seeds in the garden around you. We got to think about what the, our vision as, as Red Oak was. Anybody remember how we, we came up with the name Red Oak? Right? I had done a church plant in, um, in, called Encountering Ministries, right, over on the other side of town. And First Baptist Church was here, and, and they had asked me to come in and kind of do some of the same things, similar-wise, right, that we were doing and grow. And then all of a sudden, think about this, because this is going to play right into Paul's point. All of a sudden, COVID hit. And COVID was a time of suffering for a lot of people. And what did the seed do that God was planting here? We merged together. We grew. We grew. That what the world throws at us to stamp out the seed is either going to crush you or it's going to grow you. And we decided to grab the roots next to each other because Encountering Ministries had certain technology to put things out online, okay? First Baptist had the space for us to come together, and we said we're better together than we were apart, and we used that time, that time of that pandemic when everybody was, was feeling stressed, and we said we're either, it's either going to crush us, it's either going to crush us as a church, or it's going to grow us, and we grabbed hands, and we grabbed hands with God, and we went forward, and we grew in, in the face of it, right? Isn't that what Paul's talking about? We're in this garden together. We can't forget our name. I'll never forget how it came about. I'm on a long rabbit trail now. Might as well go with it, right? We said, all right, we're going to come together. And I just preached the sermon on redwood trees, that they grow to be the tallest trees, right, in the world, I believe, right? 300 feet, I think it was. I can't remember. But yeah, and what they do is they don't just grow their roots down. They grab the roots of the trees next to them to provide greater stability, and they fuse the roots together. And I remember people going, that should be the name of our, of our merged church. That should be the name. That's what we're doing. And I'm like, there's no redwood trees in Massachusetts. It's a great name for a church in California. I'm like, we got red oaks, and they're probably the biggest trees around here. And Tiffany, right, comes to me the next day. She goes, Pastor Ryan, you're not going to believe it. Red oak trees, trees do the same thing. That's why they're the biggest around here. They grab the roots and they're a lot next to them. I said, bingo, right? But listen. In the garden of God, the walls of the garden are not the sheetrock walls of this church. There are still more seeds to be sown. Listen to the way Paul talks about it in 1 Corinthians 3, 6. I planted the seed. Apollos watered it. Say this with me. But God made it grow. I like the way it says it in Psalms because it reminds me of our vision as Red Oak Church, Psalm 104, 16. The trees, say it with me, the trees of the Lord are well watered. The cedars of Lebanon that he planted. Listen, Red Oak can't just be a name. Can't forget the vision. We're not meant to be in this garden alone. If Jesus Christ didn't want to be just a single seed, and he had every right to be, he's the only one who had the right to be. And he said, no. Let this seed fall so that new seeds can come out of it. This is God's garden. And that brings me to point three. Point three, make sure that all your actions and your reactions match the seed of Christ that is in you. And I've got one simple example for this point. Simple, basic example. But I hope you remember and I hope you take it with you. It used to be Right? That the seed of a, of a man. Is he from the seed of Abraham? Is he you know, from the seed of the enemy, you know, of Satan? You know? and, and it was matched by, did this seed, this person, did they pick up their mat on the Sabbath? Um, did they wash the appropriate amount of times before they ate a meal, or are they still unclean? Did they follow the letter of the law in all circumstances the way we've interpreted it? And that's how they've, they judge the seed. Now? The way the seed is judged, does the seed that is in you match the seed from which it came?
Does the seed in you match the seed from which it came? That's righteousness. That's holiness. That's the garden of God. Some of us might be visual, visual learners. I know I am. So I want to tell you a little story to close. Years ago, when I was at a former church, I did a sermon on dandelions. Okay. And this was, this was years ago. And the point was, I had had my backyard was filled with these beautiful dandelions. You know, they were bright yellow. They looked like the, they looked like the sun. They're just bright and, you know, glowing in the, in the sunshine. And I was like, ah, oh, that's actually, I know they're dandelions, so that's kind of pretty. And I took a picture of it. And then, within a couple of weeks, the entire backyard was just white, right? <laughs> and, and pretty ugly, right? And I was like, well, this will be a good sermon illustration. I'm going to take a picture of this too. And I had put them up on the screen. And the point was, right, be careful what you embrace because there are things that you may embrace that you might like that might be real tempting but aren't good for you and they're going to overtake the garden of your life and it's going to be ugly, okay? And so that was a, but this week, this time, as I was preparing this sermon, I started thinking about dandelions again. Okay? And I started thinking, you know what? Maybe dandelions have something to teach us as the church. Because I tried and tried to kill those dandelions. And every time I mowed one of them down, what did they do? They spread all the more. No matter how hard you kill them, you could mow them down. I tried uprooting them with a spade. I tried doing everything. All it did was keep growing them. And I started thinking about this dandelion that the world thinks is just a weed. And some people may think that about Christianity. The world may not like the way we live, what we believe. It might be a weed to the ways of the world. And they might try to cut it down. But when they do, it just keeps spreading. It looks kind of like this for you visual learners out there. Go ahead, T. That there was one who was beautiful, a seed named Jesus Christ who was beautiful to be held, but the world did not receive him. And they cut him to the ground, but when he fell to the ground, he produced many seeds. And in their efforts to stamp him out, all they did was create more beauty in God's garden. Now hold on. We got somewhere else to go with this. Because if we're going to take what Paul says, the mystery of Christ in you, that that seed that fell to the ground is in you now, well, then there's more to be had. Go ahead, Tiffany. That somehow that seed in you that's growing and turning into something beautiful, you know what? You might find that the world tries to cut you down. You might find that it's trying to bury you. But if you hold on to Jesus Christ, if you love him with all your heart, you go forward, you persevere anyways, there's a garden left to be made. And all that seeds are going to do is keep spreading. Because in this plot twist, God's garden keeps growing. Let's pray. Almighty God, we thank you for today. We thank you for the gift of your word. We thank you, Lord, for this great and wonderful twist. That the seed of Christ, this imperishable, incorruptible seed, is alive in us. And you truly are our Father, a good, good Father. Help us, Lord, to live a life that views everything from that perspective. Our ups, our downs, our triumphs, our tragedies. Help us to keep moving forward because there are more seeds left to be planted. Use us, Lord. Use the great moments of our life. Use even the hard moments of our life, Lord, to continue to grow your garden. We ask in Christ's name, amen. <coughs> this time I'm going to ask our worship team to come up as we get ready to sing our final song.
I searched the world But it couldn't fill me A man's empty praise Treasures that fade Are never enough Then you came along And put me back together Every desire is now satisfied Here in your love There's nothing Now I'm not afraid To show you my weakness My failures and flaws Lord, you've seen them all You still call me friend Cause the God of the mountain Is the God of the valley And there's not a place your mercy and grace won't find me again. Come on, everyone. Oh, there's nothing. Yeah. 
Everybody, we have our annual meeting where we have 13 new members joining this church today. Praise God for that. Amen. Listen, until then, go not only in peace, but in the understanding that the seed has been planted in you for purpose, for meaning, and it grows the garden, the garden of God. Go in peace, everybody. God bless you.